everybody. Welcome back to this episode of Fireside Leadership. I am Janice Lee and here joined by my lovely co-host, Lisa McHale. Hi, everybody. Yes, and we are very excited to bring back Dan Eds. Um, Dan was here with us previously. He is a practicing management consultant for about 25 years now, and he authored the book, I'm going to read Leveraging the Genetics of Leadership, Cracking the Code on Sustainable Team Performance. And he shared with us some really fascinating stories around the research that he's done over the last 25 years on, you know, what makes elite teams elite? Like what, is, what practices do they do? And he's covered off industries from healthcare to the US military to educational places like elementary schools. And we were so fascinated with some of those stories that he told. And, you know, one of the things that really Sorry, before I before I get into it, Dan, welcome. Well, <laughs> I want to catch your breath in. <laughs> thank you. It's uh, I'm really honored to, to be back with you. I'm I'm just delighted. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so where we kind of left off last time was Dan. You had shared some really interesting um, insights and in, into the research you've done, and you talked about how these concept of doing management by walking around is really what makes elite teams and organizations so successful. Now that we're in this environment where we're all locked down and operating virtually, you know, what are your thoughts on how people can apply or organizations apply these principles to the environment we have today? Yeah, great, great question. And uh, by the time we get through with this whole pandemic thing, we will probably have all the answers uh, laid out perfectly and know exactly what we all should have been doing. <laughs> um, but I think the principle is the same. And uh, you know, I would actually go back to uh, a research question that Google began to ask itself here probably eight or nine years ago when they got looking at and actually researching um, what were the, the components of their highest performing teams. And they were somewhat surprised to find out that it had nothing to do with education. Um, it had nothing to do, you know, the, with, okay, the, the, the common idea of an elite team is let's take as many MBAs and PhDs that we can, that we can afford, cram them in, into a room, and let's watch the magic happen. But that's not what they found. What they found was uh, something that's been around for a long time. It hasn't, it's not talked about too much. Um, but what they found was psychological safety was the most important determinant to long-term team performance. And, it's, and it's, it's, it's just that idea of, do we as a team feel safe, not just working together, but do we feel psychologically safe as human beings together? Um, Dr. Uh, Timothy Clark has written a book uh, on that subject. Um, I forget the title. Uh, four stages of psychological safety. And um, I think when we get done, we get through this COVID thing, what we're going to find out is that those teams that performed well um, did so because they were psychologically, emotionally safe with each other. And the idea of management by walking around in, in, in what I have seen that's just a component of creating that sense of psychological safety. So when my boss comes in and sits down at my desk, either virtual or in reality, and says, how are you doing? What can I do to help you? Is there anything that we can be doing more to assist you, especially during a time of crisis and pandemic and nobody knows what they're doing, you know, et cetera, how can I be of service to you? That sets a, found, a foundation for this idea of safety, psychological safety, where we are free and open to talk about what's bothering us, what's working, what's not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I want to thank you for, for saying that um, in some of the businesses that I'm involved in, we I often do like a feedback Friday round, like what's mm. working, what's not working, what do I need to know? Beautiful. Um, and now that we're in virtual land and we're in people's homes and they are working at their dining room tables, yeah. um, you know, what is your pet's name? What kind of pets do you have? How old are your kids? Um, right. 
just like really hearing them is making a big difference. I yeah. think Janice, you even commented like just doing rounds and, and checking in on people is also making your job a lot easier when you're when you're you know learning something new or getting to know a new team. Mm -hmm. um, so I would second that. Um, so I guess we're just taking the getting up from your desk and moving around and just pinging somebody and saying, hey, how are you? Can we do a video yeah. call? Yeah, yeah. You know, I have, I do a lot of work in the, in the public sector. And, uh, you know, all of my communication with them right now is all through, you know, some kind of Zoom video conferencing. And, um, <clears throat> you know, my clients are invariably apologizing because they got kids running in the background and, um, you know, they've got lunch gone. They're, they're, they're balancing 10 different, you know, balls up in, you know, up in there all at the same time. And, you know, I often wonder, does their supervisor ever just check in with them and say, how are you doing in this? Mm -hmm. But also to say something else, and we may have touched on this the other day, um, say thank you. Did, did we talk about that the other day? We did say that you did mention that some of the two things that elite teams do are one, the management by walking around and two, hmm. just saying thank you and thank like you. clearly articulating. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I mean, how, how do we, how do we say thank you? I mean, I, I find it fascinating that we have fabulous technology to talk, to collaborate, but the technology doesn't create the culture of mm -hmm. collaboration. Collaboration and, 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 and you can't have collaboration without a sense of safety, um, psychological safety, <clears throat> some industries, I suppose, physical safety as well. Um, but you can't have a culture of, of, of collaboration until people have that, that feeling that they can express an opinion, they can express a dissenting idea, they can challenge a norm, they can challenge even the boss. Um, <clears throat> uh, technology can't do that. You still have to have that, that, that culture that allows that, that fosters that, that actually makes it all happen. And that's a leadership thing, frankly. Absolutely. I really um, like what you said there about having the psychological safety will breed the ability for people to kind of like be able to say what they want. And one of the things that I've truly embraced is like, not just having diversity in other aspects, like we have a lot of, there's a lot of talk about diversity, equality and inclusion, mm -hmm. and it's based on physical differences, but I think diversity of thought is something that should also be included in that. And that's a little harder to enforce mm -hmm. because you can't see it, but like, as I'm talking about this, like, what are some ideas that, or techniques maybe that you've seen, Dan, that has worked for helping embrace that culture, helping make people feel safe to be able to, you know, voice something that's dissenting or, you know, maybe not going with a pack that creates that yeah. feeling of psychological safety. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> these are both really simple techniques. And it's always amazing how simple some of these techniques are. Um, so uh, I've been, I've, I'm, I'm on several boards, um, have been. Right now I'm on one, so I'm feeling like I've got nothing to do. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, the last board that I just rotated off, I, I had the opportunity to serve uh, as, as the chairman actually several times. And, you know, um, I always, when, when, um, when we were having, we had a formal vote and someone would have a dissenting vote. You know, those votes, those, those votes are hard to do. You know everybody, um, you, your colleagues, there's a sense of, of commonality with, you know, us as the board and with the, and with the, the leadership and management team. And, you know, there, there has to be a sense of, of independence. Okay, we got all that. But when someone says, no, I don't agree with that, that takes courage. And one of the things that I always did, anytime anybody had a dissenting vote, I always try to say, thank you for your courage, because it takes courage to have a dissenting opinion. If you got 15 people in a room and everybody and 14 of them are agreeing on the same thing, it's hard for that one person to say, I disagree. And to acknowledge that courage, 
because it is it is courageous to do that. <clears throat> so that's one that's one thought. Um, you know, um, the other one, um, <clears throat> and I, I forget where it was right now. Ask me that question again, I'll remember it. Uh, what would you uh, recommend as a technique to encourage the culture of psychological safety and encouraging somebody to have basically a dissenting idea or thought? Yeah, so, you know, acknowledging courage where it's at. You know, when you see courage, acknowledge it. <laughs> um, the other thing though, is, uh, and actually a, f a friend of mine taught me this years and years ago. Um, have a pad of paper and take notes. Hmm. Now that sounds simple, but if, um, you know, you're an emerging leader, emerging leader and um, you're in a, some kind of a team meeting uh, with your, you know, hierarchical your, your, your superiors to have a superior say hey you know that's a good idea I want to write that down what does that do to that work member that workforce that emerging leader you know for the for the superior officer to say that's a good idea I want to write that down now no action there's no guarantee that the action is going to be taken but to, to acknowledge that's a good idea and write it down. Mm -hmm. That just builds enormous confidence in the entire team that the boss would re really values our opinion. And that's not hard to do. Mm -hmm. Doesn't doesn't take an MBA to know how to do that. How do you you know you have to you have to know how to master the art of a pen. Yeah. I would want to jump in here just to recap again that, that psychological safety. You touched on something that is so super important right now, and, and I guess the trending term is people and culture mm -hmm. uh, as an official title that is happening in uh, multiple time growth companies that are up and coming. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're also saying the same thing, the acknowledgement, the cheering mm -hmm. for the peers. Mm -hmm. The, uh, so not just acknowledging and thinking, but actually like outright celebrating the win is really mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talked about uh, being a board member, it mm -hmm. actually triggered something in me and dissenting votes. To be a board member, you have to have, I think, to be in that role, you, you're you already going to have an opinion and a strong opinion and a capability mm -hmm. of expressing that opinion. Mm -hmm. What I find interesting in risk management specifically is when the management team is trying to communicate or get buy-in from the board mm -hmm. of an idea that is not necessarily favorable, right? Mm -hmm. Is like mm -hmm. being able to express that. And a lot of it is actually just being heard, being appreciated mm -hmm. and valued, mm -hmm. even though it might not look the way that you think it's going to look. And to be yeah. able to um, win the, the, the confidence and support of the board to do something that it might mm -hmm. be dissenting in the beginning mm -hmm. uh, could actually be really important to the growth and sustainability of the said, said, said business. Yep. Um, so when you talk about acknowledging courage and, and these behaviors, when you're looking to multiply the growth of a company during a pandemic time, when we're challenged mm -hmm. with technology, um, do you have any advice to um, maybe smooth over some of the things that are not necessarily easy to do mm -hmm over the virtual world, right? Because now no you've problem. got multiple different, you've got different components. Yes, people no and problem. culture. Yes, you can acknowledge. You never really know what is happening behind closed doors, even though we've got a camera peering in. Right, right, right. right. Yep, yep, absolutely. So, um, Lisa, you just you just triggered a, a, a thought. So in the book, one of the organizations that I profiled is a um, large healthcare organization in Mississippi. And um, uh, I had the opportunity to interview the CEO. It was actually, a, he, had, he had just retired. But um, one of the, uh, and we may have talked about this, you know, we, organizations will frequently identify core values, which in theory is supposed to drive their decision-making. My, my thought is that nine times out of 10, that's window dressing. They, they, they post these core values on a website someplace. They put them in a pamphlet or something for the HR department. And beyond that, you know, nobody really expects them to, to mean or, or you know, have a whole lot of value. 
until you take those core values and you link them to foundational behaviors where leaders are expected to model you know, a set of behaviors that supports those values. And that, that doesn't mean they, everybody's going to do it perfectly. You know, nobody is ever perfectly going to behave in a way that's trustworthy or that's going to generate trust with everybody. It's a pretty high calling. Yeah, one of the, um, one of the foundational behaviors that this um, healthcare organization adopted was forgiveness, which I found really interesting. Um, but yet, yeah, if you think about it, uh, accidents in healthcare can be catastrophic. And to have that idea that as a leader, one of my jobs is to model forgiveness. That's a powerful thing. Um, I saw the same thing, and, and we, we may have talked about this with this uh, elementary school principal that I that I profiled in the book. Um, you know, when I when I first sat down with her, I said, um, you know, so if there was one or two words that you would use to describe your your approach to leadership, even though she told me she said she knew nothing about leadership, um, you know, what would she what would they be? And she said, well, this won't be very popular, but love and grace, and as a pathway to collaboration. You did actually mention that. Did I, did I mention we actually that? dug into it um, did we? in our last episode. So yes. Yeah. So what was fascinating to me about that conversation? One of the things was that she never mentioned the word grace after talking about talking about it initially. And, and I don't think I told you this, but when I we got to the end of the conversation, and um, there was there was one point left that I wanted to ask her about, which was innovation. And she hadn't mentioned innovation, but it was it was the next question that I was leading to. So at one point I said, so what about grace? You haven't mentioned grace. And she pulled back the sleeve of her blouse and pointed on her on her wrist the word grace that she had tattooed on her wrist. Did I tell you this? No. So um, I said, OK, so, you know, explain to me the word grace tattooed on your wrist. And she said, that's how we do innovation. And uh, she said, it takes 10 years for a good idea to get out of the academic research, you know, into the classroom. She said, that's too long. We have to be better at innovating. And so she said, I want my team to be free to innovate, to create to collaborate, um, to think of new ideas. And she said, you know, teachers are passionate about education. And sometimes a great idea doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, you know, if, if a teacher spends two weeks, two weeks teaching her class math in a different way and it doesn't work, that's two weeks that's gone. It's gone. They cannot go back and replay that two weeks. It's, it's gone. And she said, um, sometimes we just have to forgive ourselves and move on. And as she, as she tells me that, she points to Kleenex boxes that she has strategically placed around her office. And she said, that is the result of my teachers who are passionate about education who sometimes try something new and it doesn't work. And she said, we have to have a culture of collaboration where people feel safe to try something new. And if it doesn't work, we forgive each other and we move on. I love that. That actually ties in with um, another book. I can't remember who wrote it, Failing Forward, mm. where you know it's okay to make mistakes and, and mm -hmm. just keep going. And it's not the number of times you fall, it's the number of times you get up. Right. Janice, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I was just about to tie in that, uh, that point around failure. It's like, it's grace, it's forgiveness, and it's forgiving ourselves for attempting and trying new things. Because like you said, teachers have passion. Just like we all have passions to want to try things, but we also want to know that if it doesn't work out, we're, we're being embraced to kind of keep going and try yeah. something different. And so yeah, 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 that's yeah. okay. It's 
message. Yeah, yeah. And and and, and I, Janice, I love that word embrace, that we are embraced to try something different. And, you know, f- that sounds a little squishy for me. I mean, you know, it's it doesn't sound very businesslike, but yet those organizations that can embrace failure are the ones that I think, and this is my theory, those organizations that can embrace failure and are comfortable with it, they are the ones that are going to emerge from this pandemic stronger. Those who cannot embrace the concept of failure, um, those are the ones that are kind of, that, that will come out of this pandemic weaker. Yep. yep. Yeah. So as we look at coming out of this pandemic and we're not quite sure what that's going to look like, right? Mm-hmm. So we're, we're bouncing back between ranges and colors and sure. levels of, you know, zero people, six people stay at home, lockdown. Mm-hmm. Um, What are some of the things that we can do as we transition through the various stages and, you know, maybe again for a future talk that we have Mm -hmm. moving into post pandemic, because Mm -hmm. eventually it will happen. What Mm -hmm. do you foresee as uh, the requirements for leadership to get us there? Because again, we have just passed the one year mark. I think Mm -hmm. people did not expect it to be that way. Albeit the IATA said like, international travel will not resume until 2023. I don't think a lot of people saw and or heard mm-hmm. and or believe that. Mm-hmm. But now that we've, we're, we we're on this trajectory, what's it going to take for the next year or so from leaders? You, you know, again, I, it's a great question. And I'm sure if we come back a year from now, we'll have <laughs> far, <laughs> far, far, right. greater, far greater clarity. Um, someone used to tell me, you know, if, if you if you want to gaze into a crystal ball and predict the future, be prepared to chew on glass. <laughs> so I have, I have no crystal ball. But, you know, uh, if, if you take some of the principles that we know are true, about how organizations uh, can approach leadership and train and coach leaders to, you know, as I say, a, a specific genetic code, the principles carry over. Um, we don't necessarily know exactly how the principles carry over, but we know that they will. And people, if they're given the opportunity uh, for some personal um, intuition, um, you know, uh, uh, in, uh, ingenuity, they'll figure it out. And that's actually one of my, you know, one of my messages is um, we have, you know, when somebody walks in the door of, of our work, whether it be in person or virtual, they walk in the door with unimaginable capacity for creativity and innovation. I mean, they're human beings. They walk in the door with a whole lot of, you know, stuff between their ears that can change the world. And I do think that sort of that traditional model of leader where I am the primary problem solver, um, you you know, just just do what I tell you to do and don't worry about anything else. Um, And those I think today are more on the extreme end. I don't think that those are, there's as many people following that kind of leadership as maybe in my own generation. But I think, the learning is going to happen around leadership where uh, leaders today who are going to be effective long term, they're going to figure out, OK, I now have less power over my employees because they're not sitting in front of me. They're sitting in front of me on a computer screen. But, you know, Lisa, as you said, I can't tell what's going on in, in the you know, in back of that door. There might be. Who knows what's going on in the back of that door? But because you're not sitting right in front of me, I now have less power. And I actually think that that, there's a lot of advantage and opportunity there because when leaders can lead from the standpoint of, I don't need all the power I think I need, that means maybe, maybe intentionally, I can give you power. And uh, we may have talked about this, but, you know, when you think of organizational power, power of position, there's a lot of power there. And I don't know if it's just human nature, but we want to 
cling and hang on to them. Yet when we give power away, we don't lose power, we gain power. Uh, we don't, we, you know, I, I think we talked about this, you know, we, we don't lose power by empowering others. We gain collectively more power to achieve the mission of our organizations. And uh, I think the opportunity that we'll see coming out of this pandemic is when those leaders figure out that they don't need all the power they need that they, that they have and that they can actually give it away and be comfortable with that and everybody's going to benefit. Yeah. Uh, I like where you're headed with it. I like the, the everything is, we have a friend, Janice and I, and she came back from Boston one day with a, a photo of something that said figure outable. And I think the leadership that you're speaking of is really not power, but influence. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that's really where we're heading our way out of the pandemic is influencing others, not necessarily enforcing with power mm -hmm. um, and force, rather mm -hmm. influencing through example yeah. on, on how to be and how to create that collaborative effort. Janice, I noticed you came off mute. Did you want to? I was going to reinforce some of the similar points. And when you say giving away that power, Dan, I also see it as and this is a term that has been used all the time, is like you actually empower people. So you're giving it away. You're mm -hmm. giving them the ability to be creative and feel like they actually have a say and can contribute. Yeah. And you're going to see, I would say, amazing compounded results because mm -hmm. it's just not one person trying to make all right. these decisions and come up right. with, like, in your mind, innovation. Right. You're kind of hooking up these different minds and giving yeah. them permission to do that. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, I definitely yeah. see that going to happen in the future. And, and I think that's where the opportunity is, uh, opportunities are. Um, I know lots of, I'll just say men, because I am one, and I'm of the age where men and leadership sort of go to, together, as much as I don't want to admit that. Um, um, you know, we have a hard time with that. And, and we have to get over the idea that um, leadership is not power. I mean, there's power that, that goes with leadership, but it needs to be understood carefully. And Janice, like you say, when you give power away, you're empowering others. But most of us, we use the idea of empowerment, but we don't have a clue what it means or how to do it. And, and I think this, what we're in right now with this pandemic is really, uh, I think uh, going to be very instructive of how to do that. It's one thing to be to do it unintentionally. It's a whole different thing to do it with intention. I mean, imagine what would happen in a in a small healthcare organization with say a thousand employees and a hundred leaders, managers, clinic directors, you know, whatever. If every one of them was trained uh, specifically how to empower their teams directly and intentionally. This is how we empower our individual teams, but we have a collective way of doing it. What would happen to the engagement of that, of those 1000 employees to say nothing of the safety of their patients? Um, and the overall performance of that hospital, um, I, I think you, you. I think we would see uh, a massive uh, increase in engagement of employees, employee uh, patient satisfaction, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And and the other part, of what you just said, is really important, and that's learning. Um, how does an organization learn? Now, individually, we can pick up a book and read it and we learn, but how does an organization learn? How does an organization learn how to do leadership better, collectively learn? That requires more than just sending people to a, a, you know, a one hour lecture. Um, you actually be, have to be very intentional about that. You have to have a method to do that. You have to have a process, it has to be a system. I love it. Maybe we can talk about that. Will you come back again? I just love our chats with you. So 
Um, you are way I, too generous. <laughs> no, I mean, really, um, I didn't, we didn't touch on this, but before we wrap, Janice and I uh, worked together in, in a couple of things. And one of them, we actually took the, like, what is the value and what does it mean? And so we're planting some of the seeds that you're, you're sharing with oh, us in, in our other areas. So would love to have you back to talk about leadership, influence and engagement. And also, I mean, if we look demographically of where we are right now, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm two women and one man and we're talking mm-hmm. about the concept of leadership as it mm-hmm. transitions during mm-hmm. a pandemic yeah. and so i think there's a lot of value that you uh bestow upon us and, and expertise and knowledge and in turn we're using it for good and, and that's really yeah. all we can ask for you know Me our too. chats here over at fireside leadership yeah. so yeah. again um thank you for joining us today and oh, feel free delight. to come back again janice do you have anything i i mean i have so many questions, but I know we're wrapping for <laughs> time. So um, I think Lisa set it up really well, Dan. Like if you're willing to come back, we would love to have you and just have another conversation. Like there are so many topics that we could cover. Um, and I think they bring a lot of value to um, our audience. And even I'm learning a new thing and just to think about things in a different way. So thank you so much Good. for your time. Oh, thank you. I, I really do uh, appreciate the opportunity. This is excellent. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay. Okay, folks. This wraps another episode of Fireside Leadership. Thank you again to our guest, Dan Eds, and to my lovely co-host, Janice Lee. Join us again next time. Bye for now. Bye.